while I get set up up here. Oh, let's see, about three times ago, I don't know if it was three weeks ago, we started out Acts chapter 3, where Peter and John were headed to the synagogue, and there was a man that was lame there at the gate, and uh, he had been lame from birth. Peter healed him and uh, reached out his hand and took the man up by the hand and lifted him up, and the man stood and walked and even leaped. And we saw that that was fulfillment of passages such as Isaiah chapter 35, where when the Messiah comes and establishes the kingdom, that uh, the blind would see, the deaf would hear, the lame would leap, things of that nature. Uh, there will be effects in creation. Uh, that Messiah will have power over uh, weather and also demons and things of that sort. And so that's why Jesus did the miracles that he did to prove that he really was the rightful Messiah. And that's why the disciples also were able to perform those miracles. A couple of weeks ago, uh, we saw how Peter began to preach that that miracle was through the name of Jesus Christ, that he was indeed the Messiah, but they had taken him and crucified him. They had murdered him, basically, lawlessly. But God had raised him from the dead. But Peter acknowledged that they had done that in ignorance. Last week, we saw the first official offer of the kingdom to the nation of Israel. That offer of the kingdom to the Jews that had been promised to them throughout the Old Testament prophecies was never made to them in the gospel periods. Uh, that's because there were several things that had to happen first before the messianic kingdom could be entered into. Uh, what I mean by that when I say messianic kingdom is the Messiah, Jesus Christ, returning to rule and reign in the earth from a throne in Jerusalem. Yes, literally, physically. But there were some things that had to happen before he could do that. First of all, he had to be crucified. Why did he have to be crucified? Why did he have to die? For our sins. For our sins. It's the only way. There is no other way for God to forgive our sins. The shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of God on the cross of Calvary, is the only way anyone will ever be saved and get to heaven. Anybody who does not accept God's free gift of salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ is going to hell. Eternal suffering. Everybody, anybody. It doesn't matter what religion, who they are. I remember one time uh, there was an interview of a, of a famous pastor and the interview, was said, the interview said, are you telling me that the Jews, if they don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior, that all the Jews are going to hell? He said, yeah, and I'm telling you that if my own children don't believe it, they're going to hell also. It's the simple fact, folks. Uh, we don't mean anything uh, you know, derogatory by it. It's out of love that we reach out with this message, that it is the only way, because it is the only way. Jesus Christ had to be crucified. He also had to be resurrected, right? Of course, for him to be on a throne in Jerusalem. But his resurrection also is the proof that God is satisfied with the sacrifice that he made for our sins. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 3 and 4 where John, excuse me, where the apostle Paul presents the gospel there, he says that uh, I present to you which I also received, how that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and what? Is that it? Is that the end of the gospel message? No, and was buried and rose again the third day. That resurrection is for our justification. It's proof, again, that God is satisfied. And Jesus also had to ascend into heaven for, before the kingdom would be established. We looked how he told a parable of that nature, that he had to go off to a far country before receiving the kingdom. And Peter mentioned that last time. Let's pick up with Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Peter said, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he, that is God, may send Jesus Christ who has preached to you before whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Their, their witness here, the, the witness of Peter and John, specifically on this day, the witness of the 12 as a whole, shouldn't have been hard for them to accept. 
God had given them word about what was going to happen here through all of the Old Testament, from his holy prophets of old. But yes, they had missed it. Peter acknowledged that they had done it in ignorance, but now they have an opportunity to correct their error, repent and be converted, uh, and then their sins would be blotted out, and the times of refreshing would come. Spiritual life would come to them, and God would send Jesus back to rule and reign. Well, what if they didn't? What if they didn't accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah? What if they didn't accept Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth, as their king? Even now, what if they didn't? Well, their sins as a nation would not be blotted out. Again, this is not individual salvation that Peter is talking about here when he says, uh, so that uh, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. It's the nation. The nation as a whole has to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. They didn't, and so the nation, as a nation as a whole, their sin still has not been blotted out. When will it be? When will their sins be blotted out? When the times of refreshing come. When is that? When will the times of refreshing come? When Jesus Christ returns. But he hasn't. At this moment, the nation of Israel still suffers under the sin of their rejection. That has carried over into the church today, the body of Christ. But listen, none of any of that has anything to do with us, the church, the body of Christ, where we are today. Notice again, at the end of verse 21, Acts 3.21, Peter says that this message that he's preaching and this kingdom that has been promised to them, God had spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began about those things. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 16. In Romans chapter 16 and verse 25, the Apostle Paul speaks of his ministry, the gospel that he preaches. And he says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to what? My gospel. The Apostle Paul does this over and over and over and over and over and over again in his writings, where he takes personal ownership of the message that he preaches. Because the message for the church, the body of Christ, was delivered to and through the Apostle Paul, not Peter. Not Peter. The Apostle Paul. My gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. Verse 26, but now has been made manifest by the prophetic scriptures and has been made to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. Now, people will look at that in verse 26 and they'll say, see, Paul referenced the Old Testament there, that his message was in accordance with the prophetic scriptures or the prophets. Um, you are aware that there were New Testament prophets as well, aren't you? You are aware that there were other writings? So what Paul has to say doesn't contradict anything of the Old Testament. Uh, it's just a new program for the church, the body of Christ. Um, it is his message, one that he says in verse 25, was kept secret since the world began. Turn to Ephesians chapter 3. For the sake of time, we don't have time to study this whole chapter, I, I wish we could. But our, our focus is really in the book of Acts. I'm just trying to point out to you that it's not the same thing. It's not the same message. Ephesians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says he is a prisoner uh, of Jesus Christ for the Gentiles because of the message that he preached. In verse 2, at the end of the verse, he says, This message was given to me for you. In verse 3, he says, How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery. 
in verse 4, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his apostles, holy apostles, and prophets. Again, New Testament and those in the church, the body of Christ. Not Old Testament, not in accordance with the Messianic kingdom program. Verse 9, Ephesians 3, 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. Not hidden in the Old Testament. No, hidden in God. It was a secret. It was something not made known in ages past. Now look, Peter says in Acts chapter 3 and verse 21 that what he is preaching is something that God had spoken by the mouth of the holy prophets since the world began. The Apostle Paul says he is preaching something that was kept secret, that was hidden, that was not made known. Those two cannot be the same thing. They can't. There's no way to make it so. Well, we'll get to that further when we get to uh, the Jerusalem Council of Acts chapter 15 where the Apostle Paul has to go down to Jerusalem and defend what he's preaching. And then uh, he also expounds upon that even further when he writes to the Galatian churches in uh, Galatians chapter 1 and chapter 2, how that he didn't receive what he preached from men, from the twelve or anybody else. He received it directly from the resurrected Jesus Christ. And in Galatians chapter 2, he talks about two different gospels there. The gospel of the circumcision that was committed to Peter and the gospel of the uncircumcision that was committed to the apostle Paul. But continuing in our study this morning, again, Acts chapter 3, this is an offer of that messianic kingdom to the Jews if they would only accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah. If they won't, there's consequences. Acts chapter 3 and verse 22. For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up to you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things whatsoever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. That prophet, like Moses, that Moses prophesied about, this was him. Peter says, Jesus Christ, he is that prophet. In him you shall hear. And if you will not hear, then you will be destroyed. You will be judged. There will be a time of suffering on them. Um, it's interesting that you go all the way back to Genesis and Moses said, him you shall hear. And how many times throughout Jesus' ministry, in his earthly ministry, did he preach, and he says, he ends it with, him who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let him hear, let him understand. Jesus Christ was that prophet. Verse 24, yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many of us have spoken, have also foretold these days. What days? these last days that they were currently in. In fact, back in chapter 2 and verse 17, Peter addressed that. He said that th these are the last days. This is that which the prophet Joel spoke of that should come in the last days. So just further proof again that these are things that were foretold in the Old Testament that would come upon him. And then it was the last days of the law program that they were in before the establishment of the messianic program. Um, they, those prophets had foretold of the suffering and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but uh, be careful. Be careful. Don't read into that what isn't there. Don't take the ministry of the Apostle Paul and read that back into what Peter is preaching here. It's not there. You have to be careful. Verse 25, You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenants which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Who is the audience? It's Israel. The nation of Israel. 
And it, again, it's not just because that's who is standing in front of Peter at the time. It's because that's who these promises were made to. These promises were made to the nation of Israel about that messianic kingdom. In verse 26, To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. This is misunderstood by so many. Um, where he says, to you first, this had to be preached. But notice what had to be preached. Yes, they would be blessed from Jesus Christ, but in turning them away from their iniquities. Remember how we saw last time that Peter was calling them to repent and be converted, to have a change of mind about who Jesus Christ was, and to be converted, also a change of heart to give their whole heart to God. The problem, as pointed out in the Old Testament, was that the nation honored God with their lips, but their heart was far from Him, you see. So really what Peter is calling on them to do here is to turn their heart back to God. And their, their iniquities are the ones that Peter has pointed out here. Yes, there is salvation in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of all sins, but the problem here was they had lawlessly, wickedly murdered an innocent man. Who was God in the flesh? Who was their Messiah? Uh, many people look at this and they say, you know, it's necessary that the gospel be preached to them first. It's necessary that the gospel be preached to them first without understanding that there's two different gospels again. The gospel of the circumcision and the gospel of the uncircumcision. And right now, this is the gospel of the circumcision. The gospel of the uncircumcision hasn't come on the scene yet because the Apostle Paul hasn't been converted yet. He's still Saul of Tarsus, persecuting the church. And so the gospel of the circumcision here is the gospel about the kingdom. So when he says it's necessary that it be preached to you first, what he's talking about here is the kingdom. But people will put emphasis on the gospel. They will say that it... It was necessary that the gospel be preached to them. Again, first, careful in what your understanding of the gospel is at this time, but that's not it. Paul is going to use it that way in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 when he says the gospel, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. How? To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And so they tie this verse into that. But they're two different things with two different emphases. Uh, the gospel Paul preached to the Jew first, the gospel of, of salvation through Jesus Christ. But when the Jews rejected it, then he would go to the Gentiles and preach it. And that's not what it is here. It was necessary first. You see, the emphasis is not on the gospel the emphasis is on first here. It was necessary that first, to you first. Why? Because they have to accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah, as their King, and then that nation will become a nation of priests and go out and evangelize the rest of the world under the prophetic program. That's why first, they have to accept the gospel. But again, careful, the gospel here for them is that their Messiah has come who is ready and willing to establish the kingdom for them. And first, they have to accept it in order for them to rise and become the kingdom of nation of priests to go out and evangelize the Gentiles. I, I sure hope you understand the difference between those two things. That the emphasis is not on the gospel preached to them first, such as the Apostle Paul later uses it, but that first they have to be converted before they can convert the rest of the nations. So continue on, continuing on, chapter 4 and verse 1. Now as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. The subject matter is here, how will the nation, the nation as a whole, and the leaders in particular, how will they respond to this preaching of Jesus Christ? 
preaching in the name of Jesus Christ, preaching that Jesus Christ was their Messiah, that He truly resurrected from the dead, and He is their King. How will they respond to that offer of the kingdom that Peter had just made, specifically the terms of the Messianic kingdom being established, which was that they were to repent and be con converted, a change of mind about Jesus Christ and turning with their whole heart back to God through Jesus Christ. That has to be the reaction of the nation as a whole in order for that kingdom to be established. So, what is their reaction? They come upon them and seize them and put them in jail. There's your reaction. We're not getting far, are we? Why did they do this? Because they had preached in the name of Jesus Christ. And in His name, resurrection from the dead. That's interesting, you see, because the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection from the dead. And where is Peter preaching at this point? He's at the temple. Peter is at the temple. Remember, it's an hour of prayer when many people are coming to the temple for prayer and Peter is preaching in that setting, in that place, at the temple. But when the Sadducees hear it that he's preaching the resurrection of the dead and through Jesus Christ, by the way, Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection from the dead. The Sadducees do not believe in a bodily resurrection. And I've always been told that's why they're so sad, you see. Um, sorry, couldn't resist myself. But here Peter is preaching resurrection of the dead in the temple, and the Sadducees don't like that, and so they have him apprehended. The Pharisees believe in resurrection of the dead. I wonder if the Pharisees were preaching resurrection of the dead, or if... Uh, because of the Sadducees, they had made that compromise and the Pharisees were no longer preaching resurrection of the dead either. Compromise. Oh, how deadly it is to the preaching of the truth of God's Word. I just wonder if that were so here. But specifically, they preached in the name of Jesus Christ. And so they apprehended them. The point of holding them, you see, was to stop their testimony. But nothing in hack could happen right now at this moment. Why? Because it was already evening. What's the problem with that? Well, according to the Jewish laws, <coughs> um, <coughs> um, official proceedings could not happen at night. Hmm. Yeah, hold that thought. So they apprehended them and they put them in jail. But look, verse 4. Chapter 4 and verse 4. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. The men. Uh, so it doesn't include the women here. It's just how things were counted in the culture at the time. It's just the men. So the Holy Spirit does His work. We have to remember that. Our responsibility is simply to present the truth. And then what people do with that truth, that's up to them in their own heart. Our responsibility is just to be faithful in our testimony and in our witness. And then we have to rely on the Holy Spirit to do His job, His work, in the hearts and lives of people who hear the truth. 5,000 people were converted. Is that 5,000 new? Or does that mean um, people were added and now we have about 5,000 believing Jews in the Jerusalem church? Uh, there's arguments on both sides. But if you remember, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter stood up and preached at the Feast of Pentecost, when many of the Jews, most of the Jews, tried to get there for the Feast of Pentecost, that there would be throngs of people. And when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, do you remember how many people were converted? It was 3,000. 
chapter 2 and verse 41. Acts 2, 41. It says about 3,000 people believed Peter's message and they were added to the Jerusalem church, the believing Jews at that time. So now when Peter preaches on this occasion, we have 5,000. So is that Pentecost is over. The Jews have gone home back to the lands where they live because uh, many of them never returned after the dispersion of the, the Babylonian dispersion at about 600 BC. And so now you have 5,000. So I, I don't know. Again, I wouldn't be dogmatic about it either way, but to think that it's 5,000 new and most of the Jews have now gone, it seems more plausible that there were 2,000 more added and now the total of them all in the Jerusalem church is about 5,000 men. Um, but again, I wouldn't argue with anybody about it. Um, chapter 4, verses 5 through 7, I'm going to read. And it says, And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? On the night that Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, he and his disciples had been there praying. Uh, they had all fallen asleep, but then they were awakened when Judas, the betrayer, led a band of soldiers to come arrest Jesus. And so uh, some of them didn't know who Jesus was, and he told them the sign will be the one that I kiss. And so Judas went up to Jesus and uh, gave him a kiss, the kiss of betrayal, so that the soldiers would know that this is the one, Jesus, whom they were to apprehend. And so when they were about to do so, Peter pulls out a sword. Don't know exactly where he had it hid, but Peter had a sword with him, and he pulled it out and he cut off a man's ear. The name of that man was Malchus, because now Peter and probably some of the other disciples are thinking, yes, it's finally time to get this show on the road. Jesus Christ is the Messiah and he's going to be our king and it's time to start fighting for it. But Jesus instead rebukes Peter and takes Malchus's ear and performs the miracle of putting the ear back on the man. And so there is no defense made here. There is no fight made. That's not what the disciples were expecting. So what did they do? Suddenly they, they all lose heart now. And what did they do? They ran away. All of them ran away. Uh, but as Jesus was led away, there were two disciples that followed at a distance. Do you remember who those two were? John and Peter. The same two that we're talking about right here that are now on trial in front of the Sanhedrin. It doesn't say specifically the Sanhedrin here. But I believe it's the Sanhedrin. The ruling council over the Jews, those two, Peter and John, followed at a distance. John was a friend of the family of the high priest, who was Annas at the time, and that enabled them to get into the courtyard of the high priest so they could kind of be in close proximity to what was going on and learn what was going to happen with Jesus. Caiaphas, though, presided over the trial of Jesus that night. He was the son-in-law of Annas. He was the official chief priest of the Jews at that time. Most likely, it was a Sanhedrin, many of the same members who were gathered together to pass judgment on Jesus that were gathered right here as Peter stands before them, Peter and John. But, you know, that meeting was an unofficial meeting, right? Unofficial. Why? Because it was at night. It was against the Jewish law for them to meet at night. The law forbid them to do this and conduct this kind of business at night. So this was done under the cover of darkness while everyone was sleeping so that they could make this happen in secrecy and without the crowds around, gain control of the narrative before the people began to rouse in the morning. This is when Peter denied being a disciple of Jesus Christ on that night. While he was warming himself by a fire, he was recognized as a disciple. 
by servants and three times he denied being a disciple the third time with oaths and curses and that third time he denied even knowing who Jesus was and then the rooster crowed as dawn was approaching at that moment Jesus and Peter locked eyes and Peter then remembered what Jesus had told him that he would in fact deny Jesus because remember, Jesus on his way to Jerusalem said, we're going to Jerusalem and I'm going to be apprehended and mocked and scourged and beaten and put to death. And uh, Peter said, no. He, and he said, you'll all forsake me. And Peter said, no, everybody else might, but I won't. But Peter told him, yes, you will. I mean, excuse me, Jesus told Peter, yes, you will. So then Peter went out and he wept bitterly, the scriptures tell us after that event. Now Peter and John find themselves before many of the same men, many of whom had voted to crucify Jesus Christ. But we see that Peter's attitude here is much different this time around than it was the first time around. This time around, Peter takes the opportunity to witness about Jesus of Nazareth, whom God had raised from the dead and made both Lord and Christ. What in the world could happen that would make such a difference in the life of this man in just a few short months. From running away and being scared and denying that he even knew Jesus to standing before these same people to boldly testify about Jesus Christ. What in the world happened? Peter and John and the others, they saw the risen, the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And that made all the difference in their testimony in just a few short months. Verses 8 through 12. Here's his delivery now. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man by what means he has been made whole, uh, been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Short and bold. That is his message to them. Notice it says that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, just as the Lord Jesus Christ had promised to them. That's also one of the blessings of the new covenant, that all the children of Abraham, all the people of Israel, would be filled with the Holy Spirit in that kingdom. We saw passages about this when we were studying the events that took place on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. But Jesus had also specifically told his disciples not to worry about what they would say when times like this came up. That he would give them the words. Hold your place, turn to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, start with verse 12. Luke 21, 12. But before all these things, the establishment of uh, the kingdom, he talks about things that will happen during the tribulation period and also the establishment of the kingdom. But he says, but before all these things, they will lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, but it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Therefore, settle it in your own hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. So what happened here in Acts chapter 4? Fulfillment of what Jesus had told them and exactly what happened. He was respectful in the start of this. He started out addressing them as Rulers and elders, uh, at the end of verse 8, rulers of the people and elders of Israel. He recognized their position. Um, again, that was in obedience to the command of Jesus Christ 
Uh, turn to Matthew chapter 23. Jesus rebukes the leaders here. Um, he calls them hypocrites. You scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He does it a few times in this address in Matthew chapter 23. But um, watch how it begins. Matthew chapter 23 and starting with verse 1. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and his disciples saying, The scribes and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to do, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do it according to their works, for they say and do not do. Uh, have respect for them. They sit in Moses' seat. Have respect for their office. And so Peter did. Um, we might say, well, that's odd, though, that Peter continues to follow that. That he continues to follow that command. I mean, after all, that's what Jesus gave to them in the Gospels, but now we're beyond that. We're into the book of Acts now, and what Peter told them about the scribes and the Pharisees sitting in Moses' seat, that was under the Mosaic Levitical law. Yes, it was. Guess where we are in Acts chapter 4? We are not in the church, the body of Christ. We are still under the Mosaic Levitical law. That has not changed. It has not yet been removed. All of that is still enforced under the leading of the Holy Spirit at this time. Even as late as Acts chapter 21, the believing Jews are still keeping the Mosaic law. They are still zealous for it. As we, free, as we see from James, the brother of Jesus, as he meets the Apostle Paul who returns from a uh, missionary journey. The great Apostle Paul himself was willing to take an oath at that time that he had not instructed the Jews to forsake the law of Moses. What? He hadn't? No, he had not. Because that portion of the gospel for us today, again, had not been revealed at that time. That the Jews were not under the law. Here, they are still under the law. So going back to this situation, what is it that these men are called to do? They are called to bear witness of Jesus Christ. And for what purpose? For what purpose are they to stand before these men and bear witness? That's what Jesus said. When it happens, it'll actually turn out for you to be an opportunity to testify about me. And so how are they going to do that? By making everyone angry that they talk to? No, I mean, you want to stir them to repentance and conversion. That's what Peter had said, right? Repent and be converted. These people were already opposed to Christ and his ministry. And so now they're obviously opposed to the disciples in his place. So if Peter had approached them confrontationally, guess how they would have responded? Exceptionally, confrontationally. So Peter was respectful. Because God's desire for these men was for them to repent and be converted. Just the same as it was for anybody else in the nation of Israel. Yes, many of these men, maybe most of them, maybe all of them that are gathered here, had voted to crucify Jesus Christ. But He still loves them the same. He still wants them to repent and be forgiven. He wants them to be forgiven of their sins. They needed to hear this testimony about Jesus Christ. They needed to hear and believe. Um, I waver between being shy in my daily life and the presentation of the gospel like Timothy was or as he appeared to be or sometimes being too bold as it appears that Titus had a tendency to be confrontational at times. But, uh, you know, it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 through 26 there, uh, it says that the, the servant of the Lord must not strive. In other words, it says don't, don't argue. I mean, we want, to be, we want to be bold. We don't want to be too shy. But at the same time, we don't want to be too bold. We, we don't want to come off as arrogant. We don't want to argue. We don't want to quarrel. We don't want to struggle and strive with people. Because when we do, we'll find that life is like a mirror. Um, that, that what I mean by that is many times 
what you get is what you give. And if you come off angry and confrontational to somebody, more likely than not, that's what you're going to get in return. We need to remember that we need to be respectful, polite, gentle, and caring because we hold in our hands the difference between life and death, spiritually, for eternity. The stakes are high. And so we need to be patient. Any thoughts, questions? Went over a little bit. We'll pick up again next time with Peter's address to them. All right, thank you for joining me for this portion of the study in the book of Acts. Hope you join me next time.